Welcome back to the second hour of the show with no name for uh, Friday, November... Nine? Yeah. Ninth. Ninth. Sunday. Wait. Yes. Six was Tuesday. Seventh, eighth, ninth. Yeah, it's nine. Isn't that what you said? That's what I said. Oh. Ninth, Friday. Yeah, it's Monday, Sunday the 11th. Veterans Sunday, is, Day. Sunday is Veterans Day. Speaking of which, you missed a very nice uh, ceremony. Well, you didn't miss it by much because I videotaped That's it. That's right, but I watched you, it. You made a nice, ceremony, uh, yeah. lovely ceremony of the unveiling of that monument uh, uh, to all the veterans at Veterans Field last Saturday. Uh... I thought it was a great ceremony. I got to tell you, I was really moved by Misha's performance. He, uh, I saw that. On the, on uh, the... He did a slow uh, bagpipe uh, march around the monument. It was it was called the something the stone uh, for uh, marching the marching. stone. Marching the stone, marching. or I never, I what, never what, heard that before. But it it, it was. You know, it was it was like receiving the stone of school or something. You know, it was. Uh, yeah, he did, he did a. Uh, he, did, he did he did a nice job playing. Oh my God! He did was, Danny it, Boy and Amazing Grace as he walked it. Shh! It wasn't Danny Boy. It was the ancient <laughs> air that Danny Boy was based on. Okay. The reason I bring this up. Because you like to tell people when they're wrong. No, <laughs> has nothing to do with that. I am so amazed. And what computers can do, you know, my hearing is not that good, uh, and I got to tell you, he was halfway into it before I realized it was the air that Danny Boy was based on, uh, and because then I started, I, I was able to discern the notes and, uh, and and pick them up. Okay, so it wasn't all that obvious uh, to, to be uh, when he started out uh, marching, at least not to me. The YouTube computer was able to identify that as Danny Boy and write me a nasty little note saying this, uh, that this is, uh, uh, you violated the, uh, 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 someone, someone claims the rights to this song and blah, 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 blah. You can dispute this if you want and uh, it's not going to affect your, uh, your account, but they're not going to be able to uh, monetize your account. Because or, my because and that's why I left out the national anthem because when I put the national anthem in a Memorial Day, I got the same thing. Really? Yeah. Uh, but but that one was a recording, so I thought maybe there's something on the recording that it's picking up that the, you know something that's yeah. transmitted that we can't hear like the dogs. No, they actually were able to discern the notes of Danny Boy, and 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 that's what came up. So anyway, I just London Air, Air, and it wasn't. Uh, yeah, but it was even. Before that, it was uh, it, it, the story is, which I wrote to them, uh, that uh, this guy was going around uh, trying to categorize or catalog rather uh, uh, ancient melodies, and uh, I believe he was in Londonderry or Derry, depending on which side of the fence you're on, uh, uh, in Northern Ireland, and he heard this. I don't know whether it was a beggar, but this old guy playing the flute, playing that melody, and he and he and he wrote it down, or a very similar melody, mm -hmm. and and that's how it was preserved, and it, and it became Danny Boy like late nineteenth or early twentieth century, uh, uh, but so it, uh, it dates back at least from the eighteenth century, and probably a lot longer than that. So I, I won that battle, and they let me monetize it. Oh, but, uh, well, I'm, anyway, I'm sorry, so yeah, Danny, okay, Danny Boy and Amazing Grace, and it, it, it was just beautiful. It was. I it was just that. beautiful. I watched that. Was, and the stone itself is so impressive. Yes, it is. I stopped by the other day uh, on my way to work and, and looked at it. That was the first time I'd seen it, and it is uh, real nice. Now, you know, or maybe you don't know, but there's usually not too much that you don't know, so you probably do know <laughs> that tomorrow uh, the town of Florida is having their uh, stone and park uh, dedicated. Yeah. Oh, is that right? At 10 o'clock, yeah. Uh, they're, they've got a, a stone that they've already put in. Uh, when this whole thing is completed, they're going to have a Huey helicopter over there at, as part of the site. Uh, they've got a, a, a jet, and I don't know what the name of the jet is they're going to have over there. 
uh, at their, their park, and Misha, of course, is playing at their ceremony. Tomorrow. Misha Murdoch? Misha Murdoch, yes. Yeah. The uh, unofficial, official bagpiper of the show with no name. Oh, he's the official and, bagpiper of the show. With and no name. Uh, so he'll be playing, but they've got some other, they've got the uh, MCM High Chorus coming down to sing. They've got uh, a young man from the high school who's going to be playing taps. Uh, they've got a color guard from um, a JROTC program going to be there, um, as well as uh, a host of uh, noted uh, speakers that they're going to have. And that's at 10 o'clock over at the town hall on the um, 400 road. Okay. And then Sunday. Sunday is Veterans Day, uh, the real Veterans Day. Yeah, and the parade. In and Arizona. the parade will be at 10 o'clock uh, down Guy Park Avenue. And then the ceremony, of course, will begin at, uh, at 2 minutes to 11, uh, as they do traditionally with the, uh, the two-minute no, uh, moment of silence, recalling uh, the end of the First World War. This will be the first time I'll be missing that parade in, uh, oh, I don't know how many years. As many years as I can remember, which goes a long way. You have a good memory. <laughs> wow. Why is that? Uh, well, we normally go to Mass on the Sunday mornings at 9.30, so that's where we will be. You might not make it to the ceremony. I, I'll be there for well, the maybe. maybe. Actually, the Mass is at... Ten, Jim, and has been for some. Well, I leave the house at nine. <laughs> <laughs> I leave the house at nine thirty. So okay. It's a nine thirty mass tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> now, in, in, I guess uh, connection with that. One of my all-time favorite movies was on last night about the First World War, The Lost Battalion. Oh. That was on. Uh, the, uh, the, the, one with, uh, the, the one with the one that with Ricky Schroeder. Yeah. That is good. Yes. I, I saw that once. I th that was made for TV, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That, yes, was, no, that was, was really bad. excellent and uh, and awful. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it was, uh, it was, they all they all got the order to move forward. Was it in the fog or something? I forget they, what it was. They, they, yeah, it was they, certainly in the fog of war. There was three groups so, that moved up. There was so they moved up like they were supposed to, and nobody else did. And, and so they end up essentially being surrounded, or or, or deep, yeah. or, or deep into a bulge into the enemy lines, and uh, their orders were to stay, and, uh, yeah, and they stayed. They did. They did. Until they were annihilated, pretty much. Uh, and the Ricky Schroeder character ended up committing suicide later, right? Yeah. 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 Yes, he did. And, and that's, that's a true a, story yeah, from World War One. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great movie. I really enjoyed watching that. I have a closer... What was the name of the movie? The Lost Battalion. Don't recall. Uh, I think, I, wasn't that made years and years ago as a, as no, a movie? Yeah, no, it was for, made for TV, made back in the 90s, I think it was. Yeah, no, but I mean, uh, uh, the, the story, I think, was done once before, but maybe Yeah, not. there was a, another version of it. Yeah. Uh, but I have a, a greater affinity for uh, World War One than I do for World War Two because I have some relatives who fought in World War One that were, were killed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that... Yeah, there's a different connection with that than I do with World War Two. You know, I did have some relatives who served. Uh, but wait, they were uh, your relatives weren't weren't Americans, were they? Uh, uh well, my grandfather was, <laughs> but uh, the other relatives were uh, were, were, were Scottish. Yeah. And uh, I was very. Was your grandfather a citizen at the time? No, he wasn't. Yeah. Uh, so, so he was well. He, he wasn't a citizen, but he served in the Canadian Army because he couldn't get in the army here. Oh, well, that's right. Right. And. Uh, but I was, when I do have free time at home, I use my computer and search for and look for different things. And I came across last week a, uh, a Scottish bagpiper sporn from World War I, and I was able to procure that, and Misha's going to be wearing that in all the ceremonies now. It'll be a, a, it's a horsehair sporn from World War I. Wow. With, uh, my uh, mm. grand, grand uncle's uh, badge cap on it that he has. So, By the way, have you seen War Horse? Yes, I have. Isn't that good a movie? Yes, we have. We've watched, Misha likes that. We've watched that several times. Uh, did you buy it? Yeah. yeah. You want to borrow it? Well, no, no. That's okay. Well, maybe sometime, because I don't think Mary's seen it. But Did you see that? See it came it, out no. last year, uh, and uh, I went with Tim Blanchfield to see it. And uh, uh, it, I think the pacing is magnificent of that movie. It, it, it's a real slow build. You know, you got the guy working with the horse, he buys the wrong horse, he buys a race horse instead of a plow horse, so da, 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 and then the horse goes through all these adventures in World War One, and they finally, obviously, get re reunited at the end, otherwise it would be a terrible movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but, 
uh, I'm sitting next to Blanchfield, not knowing you know really much about this movie at all. And uh, when when they get ready for that cavalry charge across the field, and they start charging, I said out loud, "This is nuts." <laughs> and uh, and yeah. and it shortly proved to be nuts, you know. Yeah, just like you know, just like the old days, they they caught the uh, guys in uh, camp in their tents uh, unawares, and right behind them was the artillery and the machine guns, and uh, yeah. and you got horses running ag up against uh, modern, modern. Uh, warfare, <laughs> and uh, it was brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. And then the war horse becomes a German war horse. And, uh, uh, and all the stories get interwoven. It's, it's beautiful. Beautiful. The, the Brits have a, a documentary out on the uh, horses of World War One. That's pretty good. I saw, I saw it once on the History Channel and it was, it, it was very good. It's just certain aspects of the war you don't, what you don't even think about. My grandfather, I wouldn't be here today but for that as a matter of fact. Uh, grandfather. My grandfather was a uh, something of a horseman. I don't know why, but he, uh, you know, he grew up in... Actually, the earliest uh, newspaper account I found of him was his, was his being 12-year-old and uh, being kicked in the head by a horse and uh, left <laughs> unconscious and nearly dead. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, his job during World War I was to... was to... Uh, I guess he was a cowboy. He, he, he brought horses uh, uh, up from, uh, well, he was a horse boy, uh, <laughs> uh, from the south, wherever, and, uh, and brought them to uh, uh, Brooklyn to sail out to Europe because oh, wow. uh, they needed to be replaced at a fairly regular uh, basis. Uh, so that was his job, going back and forth uh, uh, with the horses. Never got to Europe because his job was to get him on the ship and then it was somebody else's job at the other end. That's how he met my grandmother, that's my point. Uh, he, my grandmother lived in was Brooklyn. A and, oh, and, uh, and, uh, was a horse woman. No, yeah. no, no. And somehow, uh, I don't know how they met, but uh, he wouldn't have been there but for the horses. Her name wasn't Winnie, was it? <laughs> Nay. <laughs> uh, now that the writer for this show. <laughs> oh, that's a keeper. <laughs> All right. Wow. But the, uh, note, note the time. That's going on the highlight yeah, reel. Uh, quarter after. Uh, I got uh, got my oven fired up. My oven. Oh, your brick oven. Brick. Did, yeah. you bring, did you bring a loaf? Not, not a brick oven. I'm it's sorry, a, what is it? It's a clay oven. Clay it's oven. a clay oven. Okay. No, I didn't use. I didn't well, make it's, anything. It's, in it's yet. well, it's clay. Yeah. I just. Uh, I just it's, it's one big brick. Yeah. yeah. I just fired it up to see if it uh, was going to withstand the heat. Yeah. And did it? It did. So now I got to heat it up a couple more times to make sure all the brick is. All right. That'll harden all it up. All the clay is hard. That'll harden it up. No, it'll so be. Figured, day, that would be a big brick. I figure in about point. a week I should be able to bake some bread. Well, we can have bread with our coffee. That's orange juice. Well, you guys can. I'll tell you, well, he can make some gluten free bread. Yeah, he could, yeah. yeah. According to the recipe that I'm making, it shouldn't affect uh, gluten intolerant people. I'll give it a shot. What, what does gluten do to you? Oh, what doesn't it do? Uh, it, it seems to affect my blood sugar or something dramatically. Uh, uh, if I had a slice of bread right now, I'd be asleep in five minutes. Seriously, really? yeah, it knocks me right out. Uh, it uh, fogs my brain. Uh, my, my alertness level goes down uh, dramatically. Uh, I think it's responsible for uh, uh, anxiety attacks and uh, acid reflux yeah. and because uh, really? uh, all those things went away. And uh, actually, a lot of aches and pains went away too when I got rid of it. So I, I, I had like twenty symptoms disappear overnight. Because you cut bread out. Did you, just because I cut the bread out. Yeah. Just white bread or is it all bread? No, all it's bread it's, it's uh, anything with wheat, barley, or rye. What are they making? Do they used to make donuts with? Wheat, primarily. Yeah. All right. I'll find uh, that time. Yeah. Oh. I got some buckwheat flour, which actually isn't wheat or, or grain at all. It's like uh, something that's made of something else. Uh, I haven't tried that yet. Oh. So I'm going to 
give that a shot. So sandwiches and subs and those things are all out of all all out. Uh, now, some place a lot of people are finding they're gluten intolerant, and some people have suggested it maybe because we have all these. Uh, uh, you know the, the the wheat we use now is is has all been uh, uh, steadily yeah. uh, homogenized and uh, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's been genetically changed, but it's been breeded into uh, the characteristics are breeded into it. Uh, so I, yeah, so it does genetically change, but I don't, you know, I don't I'm not sure it's an insertion of genes. Uh, or just a, a matter of... Uh, it's not what it used to be. But it's not what it used no. to be. And that could be it. Or who knows? Who knows? Someday they'll figure it out. But right now all I know is if I don't have it, I feel much better. Plus I lost 30 pounds and kept it off. So. Now speaking of pounds and keeping it off, are you uh, preparing for the turkey trot? I am. I am doing the turkey trot in Troy on uh, Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. And uh, been in training. Hi, Laura. Kids got the day off today. Yes, uh, teacher conference day, uh, yeah. and she has money off for Veterans Day. Yeah, uh, it's not really Veterans Day; it's just a celebration of Veterans Day. Uh, right. It's uh, you can thank Sam Stratton for that because he introduced the Monday holiday law back when he was a congressman. Anyway, back to veterans. Yes, uh, I've been uh, busily writing the chapter on the Big Low Sanford United's uh, oh. uh, for my book. Uh, and you know I've got it all fleshed out. Now I'm plugging in the details uh, and such, and, uh, and and it's really wonderful stuff. Thanks to your grandfather, and thanks to you for preserving. Uh, you know, if you hadn't preserved those, we wouldn't have them. We wouldn't have them. Uh, wouldn't have known. Wouldn't even know they had existed. And, and what we're talking about is this newsletter that was put out by uh, the first Gavin Murdoch, or at least the latest one before Gavin. Uh, yeah, who yeah. knows? Uh, that uh, was called the uh, United's PX. That was issued from 19, uh, early 1943 to the end of the war to the members of the Big Low Sanford Soccer Club, uh, which club got bigger and bigger as the war went on, uh, yeah. even though nobody was playing soccer. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, it started out with the players, and then their, then their fans, and the people who lived on Dutch Hill, which is you know Upper Locust Avenue area. Uh, and on and on and on, and then and then as it got better and better, everybody, <laughs> all their friends wanted to uh, yeah. wanted copies of it, and uh, pretty soon they're they're putting out a fourteen or twenty page uh, uh, thing once a month, uh, essentially exchanging letters among the guys. So that was the primary part of it. Uh, they would hear from so and so in New Guinea, so and so mm -hmm. over here, so and so over there, and the beauty of it is that uh -huh. it, it gives a flavor of the times that you cannot get from newspaper articles. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, some of the newspaper articles are, are, are pretty good and you get quotes from the guys and stuff like that. But when they're writing letters to each other, there is, it, it, it takes on a completely different color. And the, the humor that was in there. Yeah. And the jokes that yeah. they told. And, 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 the, the, and, the, and, and the and the and the and the and the black humor yeah. you know, from being in the war. Yeah. And, uh, uh, anyway, I've been working on uh, Johnny Campbell's letters. Mm -hmm. John Campbell, for those of you who remember him at all, because he's been dead a long time, he died very young. Uh, uh, may be remembered as having twice run for mayor of Amsterdam in 1967 and again in 1971. In 67, he lost a primary to John Betts, uh, who was a, a cousin of my father's cousin, so it makes him related to all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, then uh, in 71, he got a free ride as a Republican nominee and lost to John Gamolka. Hi, Laura. Uh, and then before that he was alderman uh, from 7th Ward, 8th Ward, I forget. Uh, anyway. But, you know, there, there are very few people who are alive today who remember him as, uh, as a lieutenant in uh, World War II uh, or, or even as the... Uh, as the captain of Company G during the during the fifties, uh, our local. Well, we have to take a break there, Laura. Uh, okay, 
can we? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> you want to take the dog too next time? Uh, anyway, uh, Campbell. Uh, Campbell's first. Uh, Rob. Laura, please. We're trying to do the show. Thank you. Please close that. Uh, he's in. Uh, he's he's assigned to Company M in the 105th Regiment as a uh, as a second lieutenant, mm -hmm. and uh, and gets called up as a kind of a special unit. Uh, in the Battle of Macon in the Gilbert Islands. Uh, it wasn't everybody from his company or everybody from yeah. his platoon. It was it was kind of a mixed bag of people from the 105th uh, that, that formed an ad hoc uh, committee to invade the, the, the Gilbert Islands. Uh, and he goes ashore, uh, he goes ashore, and this Japanese officer, uh, when he sees Campbell coming toward him, raises his sword over his hand, uh, over his head, as though to surrender. Okay, Campbell's thinking this is gonna be an easy war. And, and, and so they approach each other, and as soon as they get near each other, the Japanese officer takes the sword, hacks uh, Campbell's wrist, takes a big chunk out of his wrist, and then stabs him through the foot, through the top of the foot down to the middle of the foot at an angle, uh, and this is a soccer player, mind you. And uh, at which point the guy standing next to Campbell takes out his gun, you know, like Indiana Jones. All right. <laughs> Down goes the, the Japanese officer. But as a result, Campbell spends 49 days in the hospital and, uh, and comes back to uh, uh, not only fight on Saipan, but to write a stirring. Uh, Letter of that of that uh, uh, bonsai uh, charge at the end of uh, the Battle of Saipan, uh, and defending the actions of the 105th against the uh, scurrilous uh, charges of Robert uh, Sherrod of Time Magazine, uh, and you know, you forget these guys were in their early 20s. 20, yeah. They were kids. I think he was 23 when he was a second lieutenant there. Uh, ends up first lieutenant and uh, never plays soccer again uh, because of the the foot injury. Tries basketball for a while and uh, but uh, after the war, I don't know if I told you this, but I, I, I found the articles of uh, uh, the team got together after the war in 46 and uh, and, and fielded, they, they fielded the Uniteds again uh, in 1946, and Campbell comes back as the uh, manager, as the coach of, of the team. Anyway, Laura, please, I need, the, I need my backdrop. Anyway, this is from February or March of 1944, okay? And there's a letter from John Campbell. Uh, to, to, the, to the boys at the UPX. I just received the December issue of the PX, and once again the old hometown and the club is pushed up ahead of everything in my thoughts. Uh, we just had a parade, and the general awarded the outfit its combat recognition. It's a wonderful ceremony. Sometimes I wonder what all this is worth the unhappiness and agony that people back home go through when their loved ones are a little less fortunate than the majority of us. And then we have something like a parade and the haze is cleared up. You see generals and colonels, etc., hobnobbing with the men and a few slapping each other on the back and comparing this war to the last one. You see the democratic way that the higher ranking men let their hair down and show the human side not the official in charge attitude that predominates in the armies of other countries. Then you notice the soberness and grief that shows on the faces of the men that recall a personality or a little act that included a man that has been killed and is being cited posthumously. It will never bring him back, but it paints, uh, points out clearly that he is not dead as far as these men are concerned. He just can't make the next trip. I've watched them when I called them to attention while paying tribute to someone. And you realize 
that we could never lose this war in a million years. Men. You folks could never come close to understanding the meaning of that word because most of you have never had the pleasure of seeing fellows like those that raised Cain in the club a year or two ago who have grown older mentally a long time before their time due to existing circumstances. You won't know them when they come back. <laughs> the hell in a letter you wrote, huh? Yeah, and he was writing stuff like that all the time, but that's my little tribute to Veterans Day. Yeah. Oh. Uh, from a guy who was there. And this is, you know, just after he's out of the hospital and he's back getting ready for Saipan. Ends up, I don't know how many more surgeries after Saipan as a mm -hmm. result of that foot and eventually gets out. But he's home before Okinawa, but uh, wow. 23 years old. And then they write, yeah, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm in New Guinea, it rains a little. Yeah. I'm in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in India, and you see all these uh, animals that you'd ordinarily see in a zoo in, in the middle of the Indian jungle, and, and it, ain't, it ain't nice. Yeah. The one guy, uh, uh, Bill Slagus, uh, is not in the service. He's up working on the Alcan Highway. Yeah. He was the goalkeeper for the Uniteds, and he's, he's a uh, big boy. Huh? He was a big boy. I didn't know him. And uh, just in uh, the pictures of the team you see him. Yeah. He won't look like he should be a goalie. Uh, well, you should be a big guy in the, uh, if you're the goalie, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, look at that Alcan Highway project. That's one of the one of the miracles of modern engineering. You know, they 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 need to find a way to get the supplies by land to Alaska because the Japanese are invading the Aleutians, and if they take the Aleutians, they can take the Alaskan mainland or at least the coast and. You know, we have it, yeah. which is all American territory, and then Canada is right there. You know, and then they can come down the coast. I mean, this is this was serious stuff. You know, we don't think of uh, the think of the Japanese being a million miles away. They were on our territory. They had Atu and several other of the Aleutian Islands that we had to take back from them. And that project of building that road was but phenomenal it, because they're digging through the it was cross, it was through or, wilderness yeah, and, and I think they didn't start it till like September of forty three something like that yeah, uh, they, yeah, they, and 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 they and they manage what in six months to uh, uh, to build this thousand mile long uh, highway uh, uh, through the heart of the wilderness uh, knocking down trees and, uh, uh, and cry, building bridges and. and uh, uh, Frozen ground, and then it's, it melts. It's the permafrost. You get down to there. You got the mountains. I mean, it's not a. It was just you know. incredible. Just incredible through the Yukon territory, and uh, wow. Then here's these guys. Uh, everybody did their job, and that's what it takes. Everybody has to do their job. Yeah. My other thought is of uh, is a fellow named John Wojcik. Or Wojcik, we might call him. But, uh, yeah. Pronounce it properly. It's Wojcik. Uh, class of uh, '39 at uh, Amsterdam High, and uh, he died in a training accident uh, during the war. Uh, I think it was in a plane that went down. I'm not positive, but I think so. Anyway, I came across his high school yearbook. And it's, uh, and you know how they have quotes for everybody? Yeah. You know? His quote was, everyone who does his job is a hero. Yeah. And that's what that Veterans Monument at Veterans Field is all about. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure these guys say, hey, look, I didn't do anything. I came home, you know, I made it through. I was just pushing papers, I, you know, I never made it to the front lines, I, you know, whatever, or if I did, nobody shot at me, and, uh, and, and that's the story of most of, the, most of our veterans, even in wartime. Yeah. Uh, most of them uh, uh, never, never faced combat. You know, uh, Cy, Uncle Cy was, uh, you know, one of six in his family in the war, he was the only one who was actually in combat. He says, actually, I think his brother Fell was in North Africa, but <laughs> I'll take his word for it. Uh, 
And that's just the way it happens. You know, a lot of the Navy ships never saw never saw a Jap, uh, never yeah. saw a Jap plane or a Jap yeah. ship yeah. or a submarine. That, uh, but everybody who does his job is a hero. That article you put up on the Judge Report about Blainsfield. Oh, holy! I, I read that three times. That. It was absolutely. I got to take it down soon because it's actually a big part of my book, and I don't want to give it away for oh, free. But, okay, uh, but yeah. uh, that, that is kind of what 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 happened to him, what he went through, and the, no one the, ever knew about it for fifty years. The kahunas he had speaking up. Yeah. You know, I mean, talk about putting yourself in the uh, yeah. the lion's den. Holy cow! Jack Blanchfield died uh, a week ago on uh, Saturday, uh, same day unveiled the Veterans Monument. He passed away, and uh, and of course he's the uncle of my good friend Tim, uh, and Danny and the whole family. Uh, Danny was in your class. Yeah, yeah. Tim was in yours. Uh, it's just absolutely remarkable. Last time I saw him was right here. Uh, he came uh, he came for a visit. Tim, oh, yeah? Tim brought uh, Jack and Pat. Uh, uh, for a ride, and they came to Amsterdam. They wanted to see the old town before he died, and uh, this was like it was just before Tim moved out west. So it was probably May or early June. Uh, they came here. We sat in the living room with Uncle Cy and uh, exchanged reminiscences. It was it was absolutely one of the happiest days uh, in the thirty some years I've been in this house. It was, it was just a wonderful wonderful visit because he's a great guy, just the sweetest. Nicest man, uh, as short as he was, he was one of the tallest of the Blanchfield brothers. <laughs> and everybody called him, he was like 5'4", I think. He was one of the tallest of the Blanchfields. Uh, anyway, he's 17 when the war breaks out. Uh, standing on a street corner in uh, Niagara Falls, he was going to Niagara University when they find out about Pearl Harbor. He was in ROTC, uh, you know, by spring, uh, 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 most of the guys who were in ROTC had already signed up. A lot of the professors were already gone. And uh, he actually asked permission of his parents uh, to sign up at 17 and go. He was also, he had skipped a grade somewhere along the line. He had like 140 something IQ. I mean, smart he was guy. a really smart guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I forget, I uh, have to reread my story. They either gave him permission or they didn't, but uh, in any event, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't get to go in right away because uh, he, has, uh, he flunks the physical. He had an yeah. attack of appendicitis, and uh, uh, so it took a while for him to get in. Uh, so meanwhile, he turns 18. He, he was turning 18 in February anyway. That's, uh, I, I guess so, and I guess it didn't really become much of an issue because he, he was 18. Uh, but he doesn't really get to go in until, uh, I think, late, late 42. The first time I come across him in the papers, he's attending a going away party for three guys from St. Mary's who are going in the service. Uh, one of whom was uh, Chuck Donlin, Hugh Donlin's son. Uh, I think uh, Packy McCabe, I think, and my father. And, uh, and uh, Jack is at the going away party. That's the first time I knew my father had a going away party <laughs> is when I came across that. Uh, down at Isabel's restaurant, they all had, oh, they all had a steak nice dinner. And uh, my, uh, yeah, my father was going the next day. So Jack goes, you know, a few months later, and they decide he's officer material. Uh, and they send him to college. They, they put him in one of these college, uh, uh, college uh, officer programs mm -hmm. designed to, uh, you know, use him to his best. They put him in pre-med program and, and all this stuff. But as part of the deal, you, you don't get to rank past private. You can come in, honey. You want to come in? Okay. Mm -hmm. There are brothers out there someplace. All right, find mommy. Uh, and uh, and he's doing fine. They sent him to college down south, and uh, and then D Day comes, and all of a sudden they need replacement troops, and they cancel the officer program, 
and he, he gets sent as a, uh, as a private to Europe, uh, even though he's officer grade material. Uh, anyway, skip ahead, uh, uh, and he, uh, he gets transferred, make, gets a transfer, temporary transfer to another company uh, for the purpose of uh, serving guard duty one night. Uh, and uh, there's four guys in two foxholes ahead of the line, and they get overrun in the middle of the night. The, the Germans advance and get behind them, and the other three guys are killed. Yeah. And he's the only one who survives. Uh, uh, I think the second night he, they put him in a, in a, and of course they treat him horribly. They uh, uh, poking him with bayonets and. Uh, uh, stealing everything he has, uh, taking his wallet, including uh, you know uh, a, a letter that his little brother had written him, and uh, the only thing that he was able to get away with was his rosary, which he had sewn into the lining of his jacket. And the the second night he's in a in a village jail somewhere in Germany, and the only other person in the jail is a downed American flyer from Chicago. And they talk all night till they both fall asleep. Uh, yeah, they can't even see each other, I don't think. They're separated, but they can talk to each other. The next morning, he hears this noise outside his window. And they've taken the guy from Chicago and brought him out into the village square right outside the window, where he is beaten to death by uh, uh, shovels and pitchforks uh, by the natives. Yeah, the villagers. Uh, while the guards just stand by and watch. And now he's all alone at the age of uh, 19 and assumes he's next. You know? Uh, doesn't happen, obviously, since he was in my spring. Uh, but that's it. I mean, and he's, uh, he, knows, uh, he knows some high school French and no German and uh, they, uh, they offer to let him uh, do a radio broadcast home to let everybody know uh, that, he's, that he's fine, uh, provided that he just gives them some basic information like what ship you came over on, yeah. when do you arrive, who, you know, who your commanding officers are, and all this. Yeah. And, uh, and what, are, uh, you know, what are Patton and Roosevelt's plans for Election Day? Because uh, it, it was just before Election Day 1944 that he was captured. And uh, the Germans were sure that Roosevelt was going to have this big push uh, 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 on the you know uh, October November surprise, uh, 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 and he says, "Well, you know, I am a private, and they haven't uh, <laughs> they haven't actually you know I don't know Patton personally, and he hasn't shared this information with me." So, uh, in any event, all he gives them is his name, rank, and serial number, and they don't they not only do not let him. Uh, make a broadcast. Uh, they do not notify. Uh, they do not let him notify anyone that he's a prisoner of war. Yeah, the Red Cross didn't know. Uh, and this goes on for months. It's not until February that uh, that finally uh, that they learn that he's alive. Meanwhile, the Battle of the Bulge goes on, and, and all these people getting killed, and uh, and uh, the families at home, and uh, you know, I have the scene with. Uh, you know, Jake Blanchfield, his father, getting the telegram downtown. And his father was the uh, circulation manager at the recorder. And in the old recorder building, the, the, the front door was a revolving door to keep the... Uh, did I actually say in the story that to, keep, uh, to keep the cold and the opinions out? Yeah. <laughs> something yeah. like, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the circulation desk was right inside the door. So the first person you'd see was... Uh, was uh, Jake Blanchfield when you go in, who was a pretty young guy himself at the time. He was in his 40s. Uh, uh, and uh, everybody knew him. And so when the telegram comes, uh, the telegraph office just takes it right over to him at the recorder office. And he goes, takes it up to Trinity Place. They were neighbors of mine down the street. Uh, you know, and his wife is uh, the wife is working or working on the kitchen stove when he tells she spills hot water on herself, gets badly burned, and, and then nothing. They hear absolutely nothing, and that has got to be 
the sure. worst. Yeah, no, no news is not good news. Uh, no. No. no, I mean you you got that faint hope, but meanwhile you keep saying, well, well this guy who was uh, declared missing in action is now declared dead, and sometimes they wait a year, and and, yeah. and and as the as the days and the weeks and the months go by, you don't know nothing. That's quite a story. And, well, that's only the beginning. <laughs> that ain't nothing. That haven't even no. gotten into the story. No. Uh, then, uh, then he gets uh, sent to sent to a. Uh, uh, prison camp where they take everybody initially the, the, the train ride into Poland and back again and uh, and the, 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 the uh, train cars are packed uh, and all they have is a is a pail in the middle of the floor to uh, take care of your bodily needs uh, and when the pail is full it just overflows uh, there's not enough room for everyone to, to lie down uh, and as a matter of fact they, they have some people sitting and some standing uh, uh, to sleep through the night, you sleep sitting up and, yeah. and, and all this stuff and this goes on for days and, the, and, and it gets so bad that, they, that they, uh, they use their spoons to try to dig a hole in the bottom of the uh, train car so the, so the feces and urine will flow out uh, uh, you know and then they'll they then they got one guy one German guard at the top top of the train who you know with a gun on him all the time occasionally drop down some food and this you know, they fight over that so anyway they're they're near starvation and they they finally arrive at their destination and it was that was one of the coldest autumns uh, in in the century I think uh, uh, and they've got nothing but their you know basic uniforms. Uh, some of them, some of the prisoners had summer uniforms from Africa mm -hmm. for, for the duration. And uh, they finally are, uh, they, they 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 sit on the cold, frozen ground, and are given uh, a slice of bread mixed with sawdust and uh, and a cup of uh, hot water with a with a turnip in it. And and Jack thinks. This is Thanksgiving Day back in the States. <laughs> <laughs> then, eventually, uh, he can't, he can't uh, take just sitting around anymore. And they offer to, to uh, ask for volunteers for a work crew to dig some ditches and cut some trees and stuff like that. So he volunteers for that and the, has all kinds of adventures there. And in the process, because he is a guy with 140 IQ, learns the German language by trading something for uh, for a, a, a German French dictionary and his basic high school French. Where is the library? Yeah, uh, well, the bibliothèque. Well, the bibliothèque uh, gets him to. Uh, with the help of the dictionary to learn enough German to get by and then he starts talking to the German guards and picking up some more words. Now, we're talking a real short period of time here. We're talking, uh, you know, just from November 4th to uh, uh, by January he's mastered the language. And when it comes time uh, for another work project, there's like, how many people? 100, 162. There are 162 men. There were uh, uh, 160 workers, a medic, and a guy in charge. And they, and they elected him, the other prisoners elect him as the guy in charge, a private. Okay? And so now he's in charge of what is essentially a company, which should have the rank of captain, for the next several months. And their job is to build a barrier to stop the Russian tanks across the, across the road. You know, concrete here, concrete there, so that the tank can't get around. The troops can, can go out and face them, but uh, they can't get, get yeah. down the road. So Blanchfield's in charge of the project, uh, but he doesn't actually have to work because he's the boss. And, uh, and, and so he's, he, he hangs out with this uh, 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 German guard, uh, his name was Kurt Popke, and uh, during the day they would they would go into the village and get this uh, sawdust bread and bring it back to the camp, which was all the food they had to eat except for the Red Cross packages. Uh, 
uh, and they got to be good friends. And the uh, next thing you know, they're meeting uh, some girls in the woods uh, who are cooking hot dogs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he told me that story in front of his wife, which I thought was remarkable. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, the, the, they have an es- it's just like Hogan's Heroes. They have a you know escape, escape committee, and you know three of guys try to escape, and they don't, and they. They they finally finally get, as the war is getting coming to a close, they're getting they're finally getting their their Red Cross packages, and they're able to trade the candy and cigarettes for uh, for other things they need, including a radio where they were picking up the BBC news, uh, uh, so that they knew every time the Germans were lying to them uh, about the Battle of the Bulge and all that. Uh, and comes a point where they decide they're going to go on strike. They said, the Lord uh, the Lord only works six days a week and we're, we're, we're only going to work six days a week. They take a vote on this. They said, oh, okay, this is pretty good. So, uh, so Sunday morning comes along and they do the usual roll call, which is uh, counting heads and then everybody goes to do their job. And uh, so they come out and do the roll call and of course Blanchfield's in charge and uh, when they're done with the roll call he says company dismissed and they all go back to the barracks and the Germans go nuts. What do you mean dismiss? What is this? No, no we're not going to work. We're not going to work on Sunday anymore. You have to. If you don't we'll shoot you. He says well, that's, a, that's it. So they, uh, then they call in uh, they call in the major and they call in the, the, the uh, burgomeister of the village yeah, and the yeah, uh, yeah. And they bring in all these troops, and they surround them with uh, with guns pointed at them. While the guys are back in the barracks, and they so so he's left alone with these guys to negotiate. Uh, and they said, "Okay, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to decide decide you only have to work the morning, and you have the afternoon off." He said, "Says, may I bring that back to the men?" Uh, and so they, they allow him to go back and they take another vote and they said they, they said no. So he goes back and he gives them the answer and then they hem and haw some more and uh, well how about uh, well you get today off uh, but you work every other Sunday. Uh, meanwhile there's a change of shift. And now he has no contact with the other guys. They're all back in the barracks. And during the change of shift uh, you can only imagine what the quality of the German guards is when the, when the Russians are are on the gates of Berlin. These have guys. These have got to be the guys who are at the lowest level of you know the guys who are shell shocked and everything else. Some one of the guards trips over his gun at the change of shift, and all the guys back in the barracks know is that the shot just rang out a single shot. And they've decided that that's it, he's gone. And they get together and they vote and they elect another guy as their company leader. And the other guy, who has got to be ten times as brave as Jack Blanchfield, (laughs) thinking that Blanchfield is dead, volunteers to go over there and continue the negotiation and let them know that their that their position is still the same. And then he gets there and finds out that uh, Blanchfield's alive and the Germans capitulate and say, okay, you got the day off. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and they break out all the, uh, the softball uh, equipment that the, that the YMCA had sent and the, the Red Cross stuff. And the, they played softball the rest of the day, except for Blanchfield, who was put in solitary confinement on bread and water for a week. Mm-hmm. And uh, he finally gets out the, the following Sunday and gets to, gets to play a little softball. Immediately afterwards, like two days later, is the grand unveiling of the barricade that these men have built. It's like, uh, you almost think the bridge on the River Kwai was based on this story, Uh okay? Uh, Except nobody knew this story. (laughs) They have a little band. They have a couple of kids from the village uh, pounding on drums and the whatever. Uh, and, and, uh, the, and, and they march 
including the Burgomeister. They march out of the camp to the, to, the, to the site of the barricade they've been working on for a month or two. They have the grand unveiling. And uh, there's, there's little speeches, you know, and the, the wonderful cooperation between the prisoners and the, and the German people to uh, stop the Russians and all this stuff. They take the forms away, and the cracks start forming at the top. <laughs> and the two barricades crumble into dust because they left the Americans in charge of mixing the cement with the sand, and it was like 90% sand and 10% cement. <laughs> they closed down the camp and they send these guys, uh, and, and, now, and, and now really this is, uh, the, the Russians are taking Berlin at this point, and they're just a little north of Berlin. And uh, the main prison camp that they belong to, they've already abandoned, and so they, they decide they're gonna take this company to a, a prison uh, POW camp in Denmark. And so there's like five, five German guards. Uh, the, the, the commandant of the camp, uh, this uh, Kurt Popke, uh, used to go and get bread with him, and uh, you know, a few other guys. And they start marching toward Denmark, which is basically heading west, which is also where the American lines are coming. And they get uh, the first night, or uh, the first night, Blanchfield arranges for that Popke is going to stay with him, right? And the next morning, uh, the escape committee hands him the, the gun of the commandant. <laughs> they, they're all dead, except for. Popke. Except for Popke. Uh, and now Jack Blanchfield is in charge of a company of Americans behind enemy lines. <laughs> Free to go wherever they please. So Popke uh, pretends to be their guard uh, and, uh, <laughs> and and they, they mar start marching west along with thousands of refugees who are uh, fleeing for the American lines and away from the Russians. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and they're well organized. They, they send scouts ahead. They, they, they manage to commandeer some wagons and some horses and some food. And uh, they, you know, they scour the countryside getting whatever they need. And they're going down the road and a Russian plane comes along, a Russian fighter and they start indiscriminately firing at the civilians on the road. And, and when they get past them, the tail gunner takes care of the rest, and then they come around. And so all kinds of casualties. The Americans are okay. They had hidden, a, they, they managed to get in a, a culvert and uh, avoid it. And they spend the rest of the day ripping apart what few clothes they have with them and making bandages for the German civilians and, and tending to their mm. tending to their wounds, and then they they get some other refugees with them. They, they fortunately they, they got a Polish farmer who uh, understood the horse's language. The horse wouldn't understand any American commands, and uh, and he only spoke Polish. The horse the horse only spoke Polish. Uh, so they were able to take their wounded and their weak. Uh, 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 on these carts and, and, and such, and they had this, you know, twelve-year-old Yugoslav girl who, uh, I mean, it, it, horrible stuff. And uh, they get it uh, anyway. They, they, they uh, Hitler kills himself while they're on the road. And they don't even know about it. And the, the war is rapidly coming to an end. This is like, you know, I mean, he kills himself on April thirtieth, and the war ends on May eighth. So it's somewhere in there. And then uh, one night, they sleep in a barn, and they managed to manage to trade whatever they had, whatever they had stolen somewhere, for a camera. And they uh, and, and so they're they're taking pictures uh, of themselves the next morning. And one of their advanced scouts returns, sitting on top of a Sherman tank. <laughs> With a big American star on it, and uh, and then they 
and the tank escorts them to the American lines in freedom. Quite a story. And I have a picture of them marching into the American camp with uh, with uh, I, I Blanch that, Blanchfield yeah. and Popke at the front of the lines. It's just absolutely remarkable. Yeah. They uh, they get to uh, and now they just so they, they say, "Hey, keep him with you until uh, until we tell you different." So they, the the German guard uh, stays with them for a few days, <laughs> and they have they have this big festival in the opera house. They uh, they kill one of the horses and have horse meat steak, and uh, it's the first meat they've had since they've been they've been prisoners, uh, except for thank for Christmas turkey dinner they got from the Red Cross, and uh, and then they separate them by alphabetically, and he never sees any of the other 161 guys again. Wow. Well, I, I, left out the, uh, I left out the part where they get to, uh, uh, before the, the night in the barn, uh, they get to a train depot in some town, and there's a, there's a freight train that's heading west toward the American lines. And uh, a bunch of the guys said, is it okay if we hop on the train? And uh, they said, yeah, sure, you get there a little faster than us, go ahead. They get they get in the freight car. The Russians bomb it. They're all killed. Oh. These guys these guys are one day from freedom, and they're all killed yeah. by a Russian bomb. Uh, uh, anyway, so yeah. so now he's separated from these other guys, and he's with a bunch of other POWs uh, in Belgium, I think. And uh, uh, a transport or a uh, cargo plane lands at the airfield next to where he was staying and they have all the POWs former POWs come out to the airfield and out on the wing steps General of the Army Dwight David Eisenhower who wow. said in words or substance how'd you like to go home <laughs> <laughs> wow that's quite a story anyway that's a, that's the that's the short version uh it is one hell of a story. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so we got a, a couple of minutes, I guess. But. Yeah. I don't. I have to go. I get it. Anyway, that's uh, my hero, Jack Blanchfield, who passed away a week ago. Uh, and it's a good story for Veterans Day. That is. Because all he did was his job. I read that on your... On your all he did was his job. Ouch. And everybody who does his job is a hero. I have to go. I have okay. to take some people to Albany. All right. I hope uh, the parade gets as many people as the Halloween parade day. Yeah, the Veterans Parade generally gets a pretty good, pretty good turnout. Guy Park Avenue is a nice, nice place. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, good city. Good street. All right. Thanks, Jim. See you later, yeah, Jim. Uh, oh, and of course the the punchline is, after all this, after they debrief him, they say we have good news for you. You've been promoted to corporal. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, guys, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just uh, been in charge of 160 guys. And, and then he has survivor's guilt after that. And he, uh, uh, oh, he yeah. doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't talk about it till 1992 uh, when his kids finally convinced him to write down his story and share it with them. And, and that's how, you know, then they shared it with their cousins and their friends, their cousins shared it with their friends, and that's how I got a copy of it and learned about it. And I, and I sat down and interviewed him in Lake George uh, last year, where, which is where he lived, and uh, uh, got the story and a nice lunch with them, and uh, saw all the pictures. Mm -hmm. He'd been interviewed by Ken Burns for Ken Burns' World War II. Oh, he uh, was, yeah. Yeah, and uh, the Burns people had had blown up that picture uh, uh, to about, you know, yay big, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, picture of him in uniform and such uh, during the war. 88 pounds he was when he, when he finally got out. He, the, the teeth were falling out. And they were starving. If it wasn't for the Red Cross packages, they would have starved. starved. Yeah. They would have starved. They probably had, you know, scurvy. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was introduced to uh, the beauties of lice pretty early. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. Anyway, God bless them all because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. That's right. We couldn't disagree. Give us the right. Okay. And Outstanding. That's, that's our Veterans Day tribute. 
And I guess we'll probably be back next week. Uh, I'll be deep in training at that point. Uh, yeah, because you know, I only yeah. got a couple of weeks to the to the turkey trot. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's about a week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, Jim Nicosia has left us. Gavin Murdoch and I'm Bob Going, and we'll be back with more of the show with no name. <laughs>